Good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Andre Koenig from University of Illinois at Champaign, but uh, he's a visiting scholar there from the Technical University in Darmstadt. His topic today is security and infrastructureless decentralized systems. Andre. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so. I thought I would try some, some different kind of motivation, so let's see what security and infrastructure as decentralized systems has to do with this, uh, with this jungle. Um, so starting a talk on communication networks was something like, um, by now communication systems have found their way into many areas of our everyday life, um, would be quite legitimate, I think. Um, but for two reasons it won't work for this talk, and um, the first reason is exactly this way. So when we're talking about the way, um, we're talking about something like infrastructure. So for communication networks, this would be wires, routers, access points, um, wireless access points, but also uh, cellular base stations. Um, so communication networks today, when you think of wireless communication, are well able to live without these infrastructures. And that's exactly when we are here. So let's surely go back to the infrastructure part and talk about security. So for our well-known infrastructures, communication infrastructures, we are quite secure within these. So we have defined authorities, we have defined means to control access to these infrastructures, and we have defined means to detect and deal with misbehavior. So when we leave our well-known communication infrastructures for which we know security mechanisms that will work, we're confronted with new, with new challenges. So maybe new types of misbehavior and maybe for these types of misbehavior um, the security mechanisms that we defined will not work anymore. So the second reason why this introduction would not work for this talk is the everyday life. So I'm not going to talk and I will just want to show this very short in one picture. I'm not going to talk about communication networks for our everyday life. So to wrap this up, um, I'm going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer systems on mobile ad hoc networks. So uh, in fact, the decentralization and um, lack of infrastructure on the whole network stack. And this combination is mostly mentioned uh, in the context of, of first responder scenarios. So scenarios where communication infrastructure is not or not anymore available. Um, within these scenarios, we have specific properties. So, um, in general, they are highly dynamic, so we have a constantly changing topology. Uh, we have no communication infrastructure as set, so we need the wireless transmission to connect the devices, and um, the functionality of the resulting network will be based on, on cooperation. This means if we want to have a communication between two nodes that are not in direct transmission range, then we, we, we require nodes in between to relay the communication appropriately. So from the um, perspective of security, this is challenging because it means that we won't have well-defined network borders. So nothing um, that we know from infrastructure-based systems that can be protected by means such as um, gateways or firewalls, for example. And we won't have central trust and instances, so something upon which um, mechanisms like, like public key infrastructures or um, authentication, accounting, access control, Kerberos is based on. So um, to conclude the motivation, we can say that uh, with the decentralized infrastructure systems, we can offer communication beyond today's communication networks, beyond wired, fixed, infrastructure-based communication networks, but we are also beyond the protection of today's security mechanisms. And um, these are exactly the challenges I will talk about in the following so we'll talk about security mechanisms, novel security mechanisms for peer-to-peer -peer systems and for mobile ad hoc networks. Um, for both areas, I will uh, introduce shortly the basics just to, to get us all in line with the, um, with the foundations we need to understand it. Um, I will show evaluation results and I will show um, models, testbed experiments, and I will talk about the challenges we have when we want to evaluate new um, new protocols, new mechanisms for decentralized and infrastructural systems. So if you have any questions um, regarding the, the understanding what I'm saying, feel free to ask at any time. So let's start with security and peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, just for the basics, the, the challenges on peer-to-peer -peer systems, two main challenges we have 
is um, how do we perform service lookup and how do we offer security? That's what I'm going to talk here. So just to compare with client service systems, um, there we have a very clear um, role assignment. We have servers that offer services and we have clients that consume services. And um, services such as service lookup, so if I'm looking for, for some content in a client service system, I will have servers that are um, in duty for this. So when I'm talking about World Wide Web, I will have something like Google. When I'm talking about service-oriented architectures, I will have some service repositories maintaining directories of the services available. Um, in client service systems, also the security mechanisms are offered by servers, by central trusted instances. So, for example, public key infrastructures for, for um, key management, for mapping identities to communication network, to, um, to cryptographic keys. And, for example, something like, like Kerberos for um, authentication, access control, and accounting. So in peer-to-peer -peer systems, um, we do not have these, um, these role assignment. We have um, services offered and consumed equally by the peers. So no servers, no central trusted instances. The main question is how can we perform service lookup? How can we offer security mechanisms? Um, just for the service lookup, because we will need this in the following one slide, um, there are three ways to do this. Um, first one is unstructured peer-to-peer -peer systems. And um, here a peer just joins and um, if I want to access services that are offered by the peer, I will just broadcast a request in the whole peer-to-peer um, -peer system. Um, in hybrid peer-to-peer -peer systems, there are some, some super peers defined um, to which I announce services. And when I'm looking for a service, I will address a super peer and ask, hey, which peer um, offers me this service? So problem is, um, how can I assure that um, my request for a service would reach the appropriate peer? And how can I make sure that I will really um, discover all services that are within the network and both is um, a bit challenging for unstructured and hybrid peer-to-peer -peer systems. So um, what I will use in the following is a structured peer-to-peer -peer system, um, in fact, pastry. And these are based on distributed hash tables. Um, so these work uh, quite like, like phone books, if you imagine peer-to-peer -peer system, structured peer-to-peer -peer system consisting of, um, to make it easy, 26 peers with the IDs A to Z. Um, then Peer A will be responsible for services that um, start with A. So if I'm looking for a service that starts with A, I will exactly know which peer um, to ask for, and he will have the information on which peer this service will be offered. So um, just for the performance, Pastry offers a prefix-based routing. Um, in general, structured peer-to-peer -peer systems offer routings that are based on, on tree structures or ring structures. And within these, we have a logarithmic uh, lookup time with respect to the peers, um, total number of peers that are in the system. So um, what I'm considering peer-to-peer -peer systems are cooperative decisions as, uh, as a replacement for missing central trusted instances. So, if we do not have central trust and instances available and want to decide on security-related requests, um, we have to make sure that um, we need a way to decide on this, and we have to make sure that not one single peer is able to decide on a security-related decision. So not one single peer should be able to um, grant access to restricted resources. So, and for this, we need, on a, on a technical level, um, some means to distribute cryptographic operations. So in fact, not a single peer should be able to sign some certificate that grants access to restricted resources. What we use for this is uh, threshold cryptography. This is based on Charmian secret sharing. Um, it's in fact uh, a way to, to distribute the keys. So uh, you define a polynomial such that um, the value of the polynomial at uh, point zero equals the, the key you want to distribute and what you um, give to the peers are values of the polynomial at specific index values and depending on the degree of the polynomial a certain number of peers have to interact to perform cryptographic operations. So for peer-to-peer -peer systems um, if we talk about signing certificates what will be done is to um, have partially signed certificates signed with the key shares that can be interpolated to a fully signed certificate if you have um, specific number of um, partially signed certificates available. 
So we're not the first ones that apply special cryptography in peer-to-peer -peer systems. There is a lot of related work, um, too, by groups of Narasima and uh, Saxena. They considered applying special cryptography for um, admission control. This is for um, who should be uh, allowed to join a peer-to-peer -peer system or a mobile ad hoc network. And um, what they considered, uh, they, they compared different approaches of threshold cryptography with respect to um, the computation time that is needed to produce one partial signature and the join time, which means um, how long does it take um, from, from the point I send my request until I get enough um, replies to be able to, to interpolate such a, um, such a certificate. So they considered technical metrics. Um, what no one has done so far is um, to think about the decision policies, so security policies that are required to define um, how a security-related request should be handled. So if we think about peer-to-peer um, -peer systems in these application scenarios, so in um, first responder scenarios that are established spontaneously, we cannot assume that um, security policies for every um, security-related request possible would be available. So in fact, what we propose is just to, to use user-based decisions. That is, um, we authorize users by giving them key shares and um, if a request should be handled that is not predefined by security policies, then the users will be involved directly. Um, the question at this point is how many users do you want to involve? So certainly you do not want to wait some two hours, three hours for, for a decision, um, but you do not want to involve too many users because if you consider something like a, like a pop-up coming up uh, when a security-related request should be handled, then this will um, this will annoy the, annoy the user and when you think about, for example, um, installing something like a personal firewall which pops up every two seconds, what you do is just click yes, go on, leave me alone and we surely do not want to happen this in, in our scenario. So um, we wanted to design some, some mathematical tools for governing this decision process, um, so we wanted to design tools for, for limiting the number of users that we involve in one decision process, um, still having a, um, a probability that is high enough that decision process will be completed within one round of um, asking and replying. So when we want to design these, um, these tools, what we need to know is how the peers interact in the decision process. And we said, okay, this can be either a non-mediated multicast or a mediated multicast. This depends on the, whether the, the peer that distributes the requests has knowledge about the distribution of key shares within the network or it doesn't. So if I do not have knowledge about the distribution of key shares in the network, what I can do is, for example, just to send a request to some um, arbitrary peers. So in this case, I might hit peers that are not authorized to take part in the decision, and I may hit peers that are authorized, authorized to take part in a decision. So regarding free pastry, this can be done by some probabilistic forwarding, by some, some gossiping approach, or by just um, selecting random peer IDs and addressing them. So mediated multicast means that I have some peer within the network that has knowledge about the distribution of key shares and that has knowledge on the status of users. So something like the, the Skype status saying, okay, this user is currently um, not under heavy load, so he can, he or she can take part in the decision process. Um, so regarding the implementation, this can be done by, by introducing some coordinating peers, so one dedicated peer, this role can be taken by whatever peer. So if the peer leaves the network, it can be switched or by having some uh, multicast approach, so we implement it based on, on Scribe. So we have a multicast group that peers that are equipped with key shares that are authorized to take part in decisions and um, are ready to do so can join a multicast group and you can just address um, a multicast group saying, hey, I need a, a decision on a security related issue. So coming to the mathematical tool set, the goal was to um, to control the number of users requested, to minimize the number of users requested. Um, and for this, we, we developed a success model. This is if I have um, factors like uh, the total number of peers in the overlay, like the number of peers that are authorized to take part in decisions, um, like the number of peers to which I send a request, the threshold that is given by threshold cryptography, this is um, how many replies, how many partially signed certificates do I need to be able to interpolate a full um, fully signed certificate, 
and considering the probability with which one peer answers a request in an um, appropriate amount of time, then we want to have um, the success probability. This means the probability for receiving enough partially signed certificates to be able to do the interpolation and to um, have the decision made. Okay. Um, so for the non-mediated multicast, this, um, this model is based on a hypergeometric va random variable. And this uh, hypergeometric variable describes, in fact, the um, intersection of the sets of peers that are authorized to take part in decisions that have key shares and that are ready, and the set of peers that we address. And um, so this is the probability for receiving one specific number of replies. What we are interested in is not receiving one specific number of replies, but receiving enough replies to be able to do the interpolation. So um, receiving at least uh, enough replies to, to um, satisfy the threshold. So we start to sum up this um, hypergeometric distribution at a certain point, and with this we get a success probability. This is quite um, the result is quite straightforward, so if we have um, everything fixed and we vary the threshold, uh, we see that with a, with a lower threshold we will have a higher probability for success. If we have everything else fixed and we um, vary the number of requests that we send, then with, a, with an increasing number of requests we will have an increasing uh, success probability. So for the mediated multicast, the number of receiving one specific, um, sorry, the probability for receiving one specific number of replies uh, can be described by a binomial random variable. We also sum up this um, at a certain point. This is the threshold, and we um, we get to this description of the success probability. Um, I don't want to go deeper into the math here. If you have any questions, just feel free. Um, we can have a common closed form for uh, for both models, for both interaction schemes, if we use. Uh, if we approximate the hypergeometric random variable by a binomial random variable, then we will be able to apply um, Chernoff's bound to have um, a lower bound for the failure probability and with this an, now an upper bound for the failure probability and with this a lower bound for the success probability. So what we wanted to do is to validate this model in, in real world, so to see whether the model describes reality or not, and um, we had Two test beds available for this. One is Planet Lab, so you all might have heard of, of Planet Lab. Currently consists of 1,000 nodes distributed at 500 locations worldwide. Um, issues when you want to evaluate peer to peer um, mechanisms is uh, first the size of Planet Lab, because um, if you think about 1,000 nodes in contrast to peer to peer systems like, for example, Skype, consisting of tens of millions of nodes. This is clearly one issue, is the size. And another issue is the, um, the correctness of the experimental results, of the testbed results, because behavior of Planet Lab is anything but predictable. This is good if you want to do an evaluation in a real system. This is bad if you want to have reproducibility for your results. Second testbed we had available is um, GLab. This is a German national project. In fact, we're about to, to set up um, an experimental platform for future internet research. And currently, it runs on Planet Lab software, so it was quite easy to rerun the experiments we performed on Planet Lab on the GLab testbed platform. So, also here we have um, comparable issues. Uh, the size is actually less than Planet Lab. We have currently about 175 nodes. And um, the experimental results that we have a quite good control over this testbed. We can reserve it and we can have it um, exclusively for, for one portion of time. Um, but this makes it quite unreal um, with respect to to the correctness of the results. So to give you an idea what this means, um, we performed an experiment. Um, this is for, for the non-mediated multicast scheme to validate the model. Um, we had 100 peers, 25 key shares distributed within the system. Uh, we set the probability for one peer to answer um, in, a, in an appropriate amount of time to 50%, and we sent out 58 requests. And what we observe is that um, so this, um, this figure shows the success probability subject to the threshold. This is quite straightforward. If you have everything else fixed and increase the threshold, then the probability for receiving enough replies will decrease. 
and what we observed uh, is a quite good match for um, the model predictions shown in red and the results from, from Planet Lab. Um, what we did not have was an exact match of the model predictions or the Planet, re Planet Lab results to the results of our national test bed. Uh, we're currently just about to find out what this means and we're currently about to, to adapt the model to, um, to add some more degrees of freedom to match both cases. But I think it's just an interesting point that if you rerun experiments on, on two different test beds and you get different results, then um, we will clearly have to be very meticulous when we want to run test bed experiments to verify mathematical models. <coughs> So, second part of my talk will be on security in mobile ad hoc networks. So, just for the basics, since mobile ad hoc networks are completely infrastructureless, the nodes have to act both as um, communication endpoints and as routers. So, if two nodes want to communicate and are not in direct transmission range, then the nodes in between are required to relay the transmission. Um, this means the routing in a mobile ad hoc network has to deal with an with a constantly changing topology, so it has to deal with a very high dynamic. And there are, um, on an abstract level, there are two approaches to deal with this. One is a proactive routing, which broadcasts link state information periodically, and um, so a route will be available before it is needed. And uh, the other one is the reactive approach, in which a route is uh, looked up at the point it is requested. And um, this is, in fact, what I will use in the following. So I will use ADV, and it works just like um, if I have a source that wants to communicate with a destination and no route is available, then a route request will be sent as broadcast. And as soon as the route request reaches the destination, um, a route reply will be generated, and this route reply will be sent back. And with this, a route is established. So um, to minimize the, the broadcast overhead for broadcasting the route request, ADV will use an expanding ring search. This means uh, we will start looking for the destination in, um, in an area close to the source. And if it is not found, we will increase this area in certain steps. So we will use this um, later on. So um, regarding security of mobile ad hoc networks, in fact, um, due to the wireless multi-hop communication, and if you consider devices from many administrative domains, um, then mobile ad hoc networks are vulnerable inherently. So in fact, each layer is affected by, by new types of attacks. We have simple jamming on physical layer and um, medium access layer. Uh, we have more sophisticated means, for example, a transport layer. If you just um, delay TCP acknowledgements, then you will um, start the TCP fallback mechanism and you will decrease throughput in the network. And these are attacks that become available due to the, the wireless multi-hub. Nature. So what we consider is attacks on, on routing layer, and these are in general based on injecting false routing information, and one attack that I will use in the following is the black hole attack. Um, just like a, a black hole in terms of astronomy, black hole in a mobile ad hoc network tries to attract traffic and um, does not forward it, but just drops it. And in this case, um, it's quite straightforward because the black hole is closer to the destination, so the route appears to be better, shorter. Uh, more reliable and the source will, will choose this route anyway. The black hole can lie about these routing metrics and pretend to have good routes to any possible destination and with this attract traffic and then if it comes to the data exchange it will not uh, forward the data but just drop it. So question is how can we deal with um, misbehavior in mobile ad hoc networks? How can we exclude um, misbehaving nodes since mobile ad hoc networks are vulnerable inherently? Uh, in fact there are two approaches. One is intrusion prevention other one is intrusion response, intrusion detection combined with intrusion response. So intrusion prevention is um, usually based on secure routing protocols, and these use uh, means of cryptography to, um, yeah, to secure route discovering and to secure um, routing tables to prevent um, false routing information from being injected or correct routing information from being altered. Um, question is, if we use this on um, routing layer, on network layer, how can we prevent attacks on, on other layers. And in general, this is not possible by, by secure routing protocols. Um, another example are um, Secure ADV and Ariadne as a secure version of, of DSR. And these protocols um, have been designed very, very cautiously, in fact. Still, um, attack vectors have been identified recently that are able to, to circumvent the cryptographic mechanisms deployed in these, these protocols. So what I will talk about is um, the second alternative, intrusion response. 
Um, there are several approaches available. The first one was, in fact, Watchdog and Pathwriter, um, proposed by Marty. And this is just, um, if we consider a black hole attack, the intrusion response works just like, um, like overhearing whether a node relays the communication correctly or not. So if I send to my direct neighbor a packet for forwarding and assume um, a symmetric link, symmetric wireless link, which is, in fact, um, good assumption because if we consider 802.11 with an RTS-CTS sequence, we need a symmetric wireless link, then I will be able to overhear whether my neighbor relays the communication or not. So and if it doesn't, I can just mark it and say, okay, bad one, don't use it for routing. Um, subsequent approaches like Confident Core Notion, um, they try to, to overcome some, some drawbacks of, of watchdog and path radar, but they are still based on this overhearing approach for intrusion detection. What they all do is to use an address-based approach for intrusion response, so to exclude an, a misbehaving node from the network, they just say, okay, this is a bad address, do not send anything to this address or do not receive anything from this address. The question is, if we are in a network where we need the, the cooperation as, as a basis for functionality and if we have devices from many administrative domains, so in general, a user can just do whatever he or she wants with a the device, then changing addresses is possible very easily, may it be on a medium access or network layer. Um, and with this, we can just, um, just bring down the effect of address-based intrusion response mechanisms. So um, we said, okay, let's try it another way around. Let's try some location-based intrusion response. And the idea is quite simple. Um, we set up quarantined areas. If we detect misbehavior in a network, we define a quarantined area where the misbehavior happens. And um, this is, in fact, a three-step process. We have to establish these quarantined areas and to interrupt routes that are affected so that cross these quarantined areas. Second step, we have to establish routes that do not cross these quarantined areas. And for AODV, we do this just by restricting the broadcast of a route request message. So every node located within a quarantined area is not allowed to relay route request messages. And with this, the route established will just uh, go around the quarantined areas. And um, in a third step, since we assume that uh, tracking of the nodes is not possible while they are quarantined, so if there is no communication, then you won't be able to, to determine locations. Um, we have to revoke these quarantined areas after a certain amount of time because otherwise what will happen is since we are in a mobile environment, the misbehaving node will move, will have a new affected area, will become active again, will become detected again, a new quarantined area will be set up, and with this you start to partition your network, and this is what we want to avoid. avoid. So we um, revoke these quarantined areas after a certain amount of time. Um, so also for mobile ad hoc networks, I want to talk about evaluation issues. Um, mobile ad hoc networks are not this widespread in, in real world right now. There are some, um, but they are designed for, um, yeah, for, for real data transmission and the people running them wouldn't be um, that happy if we want to implement attacks and countermeasures within these networks. Um, there are a few test pits available, but these are usually um, designed specifically for, for the needs, um, so for the research that should be done within these test beds. So the results would be uh, comparable very hardly, even, even worse than for the peer-to-peer -peer case. So we decided to go for, for simulation studies and for analytical models, just to have two, um, two points of view on the problem. So um, both simulation studies and analytical models have to make abstractions um, simulation studies because otherwise um, you will have runtimes that are not, not feasible anymore and analytical models just because you won't be able to handle um, every, everything from, from data transmission up to, to routing protocols. Um, so since simulation studies can only cover some, some small portion of the parameter space, we said, okay, um, we will have um, an analytical model to cover the rest. So these are um, simulation results from the studies we, we did for the location-based intrusion response. We had a scenario consisting of 1,000 nodes, um, seven to eight neighbors per node. This means we just have a connected network, so the probability for, for having a route between arbitrary nodes is some 99.9%. Um, we have a mobility with pedestrian speed, and we have one hour simulated time per parameter set. Um, so what is shown here is the results for a defenseless network. When you increase the number of black holes considering the loss that is caused by the black holes. And you can see that um, just one black hole in our scenario consisting of 1,000 nodes is able to attract more than um, 
there are more than 60% of the traffic and you increase the, if you increase the number to, to some five or 10 black holes, which is just 1% of the nodes in the network, then you will have drop ratios loss caused by the black holes of, of more than 90%. And if you consider that there will be some inherent loss due to collisions, due to route breaks, then this network will be down. Um, so for the address-based intrusion response, we considered also the loss that is caused by black holes, but subject to the frequency with which misbehaving nodes change their addresses. So in fact, intrusion detection system will detect a misbehaving node, and after a certain time, this misbehaving node will change the address, and if you exclude a misbehaving node based on its address, then um, you can circumvent the countermeasures. So what we can see is that um, for low frequency, so for static addresses, the, location, the address based intrusion response works quite well. If you start changing the addresses, then um, the loss will increase and the effects um, of, the, of the address based intrusion response will decrease. This is quite straightforward. And in fact, this is a quite, quite simple approach to, to circumvent address based strategies. So you can have some more sophisticated ones by saying, okay, if I do not receive, as a, as a misbehaving node, if I do not receive data for some, um, for some amount of time, I will change my address. So you can um, even improve this effect from, from the perspective of the misbehaving node. So for the location-based approach, we evaluated the um, loss that is caused by black holes uh, subject to the quarantine time. This means the, the time with, during which one, one quarantine area is active. And, um, Clearly, if we choose this too short, we will have a bad effect on, on loss, so we will have quite high loss rates. If we um, optimize this, and in this case, the optimum is that, um, so for, um, for the scenario given here, the optimum is about 300 seconds quarantine time, then we will have um, loss ratios that clearly outperform the results from the address-based response. If we are confronted with misbehaving nodes, changing addresses, yes, please. Pardon? Mobility model is a random waypoint model. No pause time. Con it's between one and two meters per second. So it's a, it's a pedestrian scenario. And in fact, we, we split up um, because if you use a random waypoint model, which is kind of a, a worst case model regarding mobility. Um, if you have more predictable scenarios, then we'll be able to optimize countermeasures, something like, like um, um, wireless networks for cars, for example, vehicular ad hoc networks. Um, anyway, to, to reduce um, unwanted effects of this um, random waypoint model, because um, when you use random waypoint model, the nodes tend to, to go to the center, and we split up the simulation time. So we used simulation time, we had um, several runs, so this, this one hour is split up in, into several runs consisting of some five or 10 minutes just to limit the negative effects of these, um, of these random waypoint model. Okay. So other questions on this? So the second point we have to consider is the loss caused by intrusion response. And uh, we charge packet loss to the intrusion response um, from the time misbehavior is detected until it takes to inform the source and to stop sending data. So it takes some time when the intrusion is detected, there is an error message sent back and during the time this error message travels to the source, the source will still be sending data and this data will be dropped and we charge this to the intrusion response and not to the misbehavior anymore. Um, so for the address-based intrusion response, this loss is quite low because we just exclude one, one single point from the network, just one node. If we consider the location-based approach, um, this is clearly a drawback of the location-based approach because we do not exclude um, one single point from the network, but exclude an, a certain area from the network. So we also exclude nodes that are located in proximity to a misbehaving node, but are well-behaving, so could be used for routing. So. Um, this is clearly a drawback which we addressed in, in, in further work, and I will come back to this later. Um, so this is the overall loss, just to, to give the comparison. You can see that um, the curve of a defenseless network is raised by some, some 10% compared to the black hole loss. This is due to, to inherent loss, and here you will see that we are 
um, far above 90% for 10 misbehaving nodes and nothing will happen anymore on this network. So also for the address-based response, the results we saw from the last slide are, are raised due to inherent network loss. But what we can see is that all, although we have higher loss for the address-based, uh, for the location-based approach than for the address-based approach, due to the intrusion response mechanism itself, we're able to, um, to have a lower overall loss for the location-based approach than for the address-based response. Still, loss rates of some 35% um, in a black hole case are not tolerable, and I will come back to how to improve this on a later slide. So I said we wanted to have two viewpoints on the problem. So um, the analytical model for mobile ad hoc networks um, is in fact a quite, quite simple model that is easy to understand. And if you read the paper, you will say, okay, um, yeah, I agree to this. Um, the model is based on probabil probabilistic approaches combined with uh, geometry. So for example, for the effects of the black hole attack, what we describe is um, the probability for the black hole being in a closer ring regarding the ADB ring search than the destination. This means that if a black hole is uh, located in, in the same or closer ring than the destination, the route request will reach the black hole, the black hole will be able to answer and um, will attract the traffic. The black hole is further away than the destination with respect to the ring search, then um, the, black, no, the route request will just not reach the black hole and the black hole will have no chance to get active. So I don't want to go into the math here, but in fact these um, few formulas are, are the core of the uh, description of this, um, this black hole attack. There is not, not much more on this. So the effects of the location-based intrusion response were also described by a probabilistic approach combined with the geometry. So what we describe here is the, um, the carotine areas and the effect that we have when the black hole moves. So the old carotine area is still active. The black hole moves, will be active again, will get detected again and will have a new area of influence where it can get active. And if we can describe this, this area and the number of nodes that will be located within this area, we can describe the loss that is caused by um, location-based intrusion response, and we can describe the loss that can be caused by black holes when they move for, for a certain distance. And still, the model is quite simple. So what you can see here is, in fact, the, the core of the model, um, not much more around it. Um, what I want to show before I come to my last slide is the comparison of the model predictions with the simulation results. So what you can see here, um, the curves in fact are the, the predictions that were made by the model and the confidence bars, so the intervals here, are taken from the simulation studies from, from the previous slides. And you can see that um, even if we have a quite simple model and we use heuristics to, to approximate um, side effects on, on the edges of the network area, we have quite good matches um, with, uh, with our analytical model and the simulation studies. And this could be a hint that um, this is what we can observe in, in real world scenarios. So um, to come to the end, if you don't want me to continue, um, just to wrap this up, we've seen that address-based intrusion response in mind is, is not the way that, that should be done. Location-based intrusion response seems promising, um, yet we have to do some improvements. We have, because some um, well-behaving nodes, bang nodes that could be used for, um, to establish the network are excluded when they are in proximity to misbehaving nodes. The question is how can we improve this location-based approach and we studied two approaches. And one is um, harnessing the delay tolerance of applications. So if you consider something like short message services or email, um, then the, the transmission could just be delayed if you are in a, in a quarantined area until you leave this area. And this should be done transparent to the user. So for the emergency response scenarios, it's just something like um, it's better to deliver an emergency call some 20 seconds later than never at all. Um, what we found is that we can recover the functionality of the network subject to the loss caused by black holes nearly completely. So we can have some, some good put in the network of, of near 100% if we are able or if we are willing to take transmission delays that for the scenario that I just showed you may reach up to several minutes. Um, second approach, if we have some some more constrained communication regarding time is to use an adaptive transmission power of the nodes. And this is just to, um, to minimize 
the size of the quarantined areas. This means that um, if I'm located closer to a, a well-behaving node than to a misbehaving node, I can try to adapt my transmission power that, such that I reach the well-behaving node, but not the misbehaving node. And with this, you can limit the size of the quarantined areas that are excluded from the network. And with this, you can limit the number of affected nodes, of affected well-behaving nodes. So in fact, um, that's what I wanted to show you up to now. If you want me to, I can go into details of these um, delay tolerant approaches and address based um, and um, transmission power reduction. Otherwise, I would just end my talk here. Thank you for your attention and be open for questions. Okay.